first it's necessary to make corrections. <laughs> the first correction is that I'm not a professor of chemistry. In fact, the chemists uh, basically loathe me. I'm a something called a university professor, and it's important to explain what a university professor is because it is relevant to this, this lecture. A university professor is someone at Harvard who is entitled to give a course on any subject, regardless of whether he knows anything about it or not, <laughs> to students, regardless of whether they want to know anything about it or not. So that's the way you should think about this. The second thing is <clears throat> that I put together, I thought, a really terrific talk. It was really a good talk on basically biological physics and the things that you could do with that. And Patrick looked at it and said, nonsense, none of that. So you're going to get something else. We'll see what it is. So I should say that this talk is probably going to be a little bit unusual for this audience because it is a talk more about public policy than it is about science per se. Now, I don't know how many of you go to public policy talks, probably not too many, but it's very relevant because the landscape for science um, in the US, in Europe, everywhere is changing right now for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about. And so what I'm going to do is to talk about largely academic science but from the perspective of people who are not scientists. These are people who have something that you all are interested in, which is known as money. And so we'll be talking about how the outside world thinks about chemistry, how chemistry and related areas, condensed matter physics, whatever, might think about itself in a way that looks forward in terms of understanding how you get along with the society that you're working in. That's, that's the basic agenda. And you can ask the question of whether I'm qualified to talk about this, and that's not relevant because I am talking about it. I wanted just to start with something which I grabbed out of the preceding talk. And this is because the institute, the original talk was about microfluidics and things related to this. And I just want to put it up here because it illustrates some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, <laughs> If you like, I can show you how to turn it off. <laughs> I thought I was better in technology. So I want you just to take a look at a couple of these things because they illustrate some points that are interesting. Um, these are all topics that I happen to think are going to be interesting and important in microfluidics. Microfluidics is an area which has started as a kind of branch of analytical chemistry. And it's now become, in principle, something more interesting, except for the fact that most of the people who are working on it are still working in analytical chemistry. And so what are some of the topics and why are they interesting? And it has a lot to do with what I'm going to be talking about. Water and soil, for example. Um, we talk endlessly now about biomass and energy. It's a broad, motivating subject. But we sort of forget because most of you have probably never actually seen a plant grow on a farm, that a plant grows in soil, and soil is not a renewable resource. I mean, we think of soil as being something that's there forever, but soil is actually very much like a coal seam, and you use it up. How do you maintain it? And that is in large part going to be some mineral replacement, but a lot of it is microfluidics, because what goes wrong with soils is they turn into concrete when they're used incorrectly, and then they're not useful. I'm just going to go through a couple of these. Explosively formed projectiles. The reason why people are interested in these is that they are a really major threat to both military operations and to society. And an explosively formed projectile is an interesting widget, which basically looks like the ones that are used look like about a coffee can. The back end is filled with high explosive, and the front end has a copper plate in a carefully designed geometry. And when the explosive goes off in the back, what it does is sends a shock wave through this thing that takes the copper plate and collapses it into a jet of liquid copper at hypersonic velocities. It turns out this goes through anything, pretty much, because there are very, very interesting things that happen in fluids. When you take anything, a rod or a fluid, and you run it into a solid, the energy can be dissipated only at the speed of sound. 
because that's how rapidly vibrations travel in the solid. So what happens when the thing that's coming in is coming in at three times the speed of sound? And what happens is new physics with a lot of very interesting fluidics in it. Now, why is that interesting here? And the answer is that it's brand new science. One doesn't really know very much about this kind of stuff. I think there are a lot of things that can be done with it. But it's, it's a subject which, for those of you who are interested in microfluidics, don't think just about doing ELISAs. You can think much more broadly than that. Um, let's take another one just for the sake of arguments. We'll do two more and then go on. Hematology. Microfluidics as an analytical methodology is really interesting, but the thing that's probably more interesting is that all of you are full of blood. That's really, people are engaged with that idea. And the blood is dispersed because it's, it's about 50% erythrocytes, which are particles which are squishy. How does this actually work? It turns out we don't have very, a very good idea. And I'll just give you one example. Erythrocytes are slightly larger than capillaries. So when the erythrocyte goes through a capillary, it has to squeeze through. That's the result of evolutionary pressure to do something. And the question is what? Why, are, why is it larger? Why not smaller? And the answer is we actually don't know. So we don't know why you work. As a matter of fact, you can argue that many of you don't work. In fact, I'm sure that I don't work. But that's, that's by the by. And then just one last one. Uh, all of these are interesting, but we'll do one last one for the sake of, of information. Probably the single technology that's done the most to change the world in the last 50 years has been information technology. So I was raised in a generation without Facebook. And you were raised in a generation with Facebook. And as far as I'm concerned, you're a completely different species. I have no idea <laughs> what makes you run, and I'm not sure I even approve of it. But the issue there is that what one does is an enormous amount of really very sophisticated stuff using a fluid which is called electrons in uh, semiconductors and metal wires. The question for a microfluidics community is what can you compute using fluids? And you say, well, you can't compute anything. But of course, actually, a cell is a computer. And so you can compute all kinds of things. It's just we don't think about it that way. These are just examples of problems in sort of biological physics to think about. That's not what I'm going to talk about. So you say, why did I bother you with it? And the answer is that I'm sitting and standing in front of the room, and I can say what I want for a while. <laughs> all right, let's go on to a more serious thing. This is the basic public, question, public policy question now. And it's, I, you may not see it in Europe, but I promise you it's here as much as it is in the United States. We have a history in academic science in which we say that science progresses based on the curiosity of smart people pursuing their curiosity. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But there's another point of view which says that science progresses by smart people taking problems that need to be solved and solving them. And they're very different in the way you think about the structure of the science and the education that does it. So we have been in a world in which curiosity was sort of the basic idea. Are we switching to one in which problem solving is the basic idea? And I will argue to you that we are for a variety of reasons and that one needs to think about it. And in principle, the Microfluidics Institute, which has a set of initials, but I can't remember what they are, IS? IP. GG. GG. Okay. Okay. Um, is, is intimately involved. So what's the objective then from a public policy point of view? Are we doing whatever we're doing in order to do the most creative research, which is one argument, or the most useful research? which maybe is the same thing or maybe it's a different thing. It's a little bit hard to know. And are we doing research, which is the research that society is willing to pay for, which is arguably yet a dumb thing, or the least ennobling of these ideas is that we're doing research because we think we can get it through the peer review system and get money to do the next bunch of research, which is done just through the peer review system to get money, which is awful. I mean, it's awful, but a lot of people do it. So 
What is the objective? And when you think about your research, how do you think about it? I want to give you some observations, and I'm going to use chemistry as an example, but I could use physics just as well, and the figures in some way in biology are even more horrible. But chemistry has always been a middle-of-the-road subject. In the United States, in the last 20 years, there has been a decrease in the workforce, in the technical workforce in chemistry, of 300,000 jobs, which is a lot, mostly R&D. And in the pharmaceutical industry globally, there has been a loss in jobs of about 300,000, also mostly in R&D. Why is it R&D? And the answer is that if you're a CEO and you're faced with meeting your numbers for Wall Street, the easiest way of doing it is to lay off people. You cut expenses because it's easier to cut expenses than it is to increase revenues. And if you're a clever CEO, what you do is you cut the salaries and the workforce in those subjects which, whose benefit for the company are the farthest in the future. And that's mostly research and development. So what you see here is Wall Street in operation. I mean, it's American-style capitalism where the figure of merit is the return on invested capital. I mean, you can argue whether it's right or wrong, but it's sort of the reason why this is happening. But you can ask the question then, given the fact that we've laid off almost half a million people, more than half a million people, and a lot of the R&D talent in chemistry and pharmaceutical industry, is there anything left to do? I mean, is it over as a field? And I think all of us would argue the answer to that has to be no. I just want to show you some examples of things to think about. And I'll make a few microfluidic connections. This is a picture that comes straight off the Department of Energy website. And it's an extremely interesting picture. This is large-scale stuff. These are inputs to the energy economy. These are outputs to the energy economy. I won't make any effort to go through this other than to make a couple of points. One of them, on the output side, the, if you look at lost energy you know, in transmission and electrical lines and various forms of wastage, it's about 55%, and the useful energy, energy that's used for some purposes, is about 40 What that says immediately, for those of you who are interested in energy, is the most important, interesting opportunity is not in generating new forms of energy. It's not in doing new solar photovoltaics. It's in conservation, and that's useful to know. The other side is over here, and this has not yet been updated to the single most important technical change in the energy industry. But what you see here is that coal, natural gas, and petroleum together account for about 85% of the world's energy. I promise you that's not going to change much. It just takes so long to rebuild an energy, a global scale economy for anything that no matter how much we want it to, it isn't going to change. Nuclear, especially of France, is a significant part of this. Solar is this little yellow line here. It's not significant now. <clears throat> it may turn out to be more significant. People are hoping for somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of grid. <clears throat> but that number is now fixed by something I'll come back to. Wind might be as much as 10, 15 percent. These are not going to be important, I don't think. But then the interesting question on the input side are, or is, what are the two, two things have happened in the last couple of years that have absolutely changed the landscape in energy? What do you all think they are? Complete change. The world in 2000 is, has, bears no resemblance to the world now. Shale gas. That's one. So we now think that the world is awash in shale gas, in, in methane. And there's so much of it that the ener United States, which has been the largest energy importer in the world, is going to be an exporter in the immediate future. So the U.S. is going to go back to being Nigeria. We're going to export energy to the rest of the world. The other one that's really interesting, and the technical invention there, incidentally, was learning how you drill a hole a couple of miles down, make a right angle turn, and then drill for another couple of miles horizontally, and then pressurize that to frack. Uh, 
and all this is really interesting stuff, which is all microfluidics. The other major change is that the Chinese government has decided to make capital available at an abnormal cost for Chinese manufacturers in the area of solar and wind. So what that has done is to make it extremely unattractive, essentially impossible, to introduce new technology in solar and wind because it's just so cheap to buy current generation silicon solar. So the commercial motivations for doing new photovoltaics and new wind have gone away. There wasn't, I mean, wind is sort of what it is anyway. You can make better composite blades. But the, the silicon solar versus other kind of solar actually is an interesting question. Then it's just not going to happen. All the companies that were doing it in the United States are in the process of going out of business right now. So interesting changes. And they make the case that money actually does make a difference in what technology gets developed. This is a terrific plot. I'm very fond of this because it's very relevant to me. The cost of life, a long life. <clears throat> I stand before you as an example that something goes right in medicine because in 1900 I would have been dead at this point by about 30 years. And you can argue whether I am or not, but from an internal perception it seems that I'm alive. But there's some very interesting, very interesting numbers here. This side, which refers to these, is the annual average life expectancy in these different countries, Japan to Portugal. And what you see on this plot, and there are various ways of doing it, is that lifespan basically runs from a little bit more than 80 years to uh, somewhere around 78 or something like that. And the first thing that you see is that no matter how much you spend from the United States is actually up here. It's about $7,500 a year. Cuba is here. It's about zero. And the two have the lifespan, the same lifespan. What the first order plot says is that there's no correlation between the amount of money that a country spends and the lifespan. That You can argue whether lifespan is the best measure of public health, but that's secondary the number. The more interesting conclusion from this is that the medical profession isn't actually doing anything. I mean that very generically. That no matter how much you spend, if no matter how much you spend, it doesn't make any difference then one inference from that is that whatever you're spending it on isn't doing anything. And the argument here is, you know, again, a, a one having to do with money. The global healthcare industry is basically set up on a capitalist model. That is, those diseases which are treated are those which are profitable. They're mostly end of life, and that's not actually where the advances in lifespan have come from. They've come from clean water, safe food, not smoking, exercise, all the rest of that kind of stuff, public health kinds of things. And this is going to be a big deal in your all's lifespan because the cost of doing this kind of health care is just not supportable. It's the only financial problem the United States has, the amount of money that we're spending on, on health care. <clears throat> so there will be enormous pressures to reduce that, which means that microfluidics is not going to be doing cancer, it's going to be doing public health. And that's a prediction, which I will not live long enough to see carried out, but I'll be willing to put big money from my estate if that's correct. Incidentally, on this, a very famous U.S. physician, whose name was Lewis Thomas, who was the president of the American Medical Association and the president of Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is one of our big cancer hospitals, is fond, was fond of saying that 80% of what's wrong with you goes away if left untreated and the other 20% the medical profession can't do anything about anyway. Just something to think about. Now, those are all practical. Here are some things that are, that are more intellectual problems. This is a cell. And to me, this is the most interesting scientific question of our Ural's generation. And I'll phrase it in the following fashion. If, as a reductionist scientist, you look at this, what you know is that it's a collection of molecules of various sorts. And the molecules are reacting. And what you know is that molecules are not alive. And you know that reactions are not alive, but the collection of molecules and reactions is alive. So how did that happen? How do you go 
from a bunch of components which are not alive to something that is alive? And I think the honest answer to that is we have no idea, zero. That is, there is no hypothesis, there is no theory, there is no supporting underlying notion of how you go from something that is not alive to something that's alive. And it's a wonderful, wonderful question, absolutely wonderful um, fundamental question in science, which, by the way, will have enormous practical implications if you could ever figure it out. We will figure it out eventually, but not for a while. And here's another one of these dual-use kinds of questions. What you see here is a, a modern invention. These have never existed before. That's Mumbai. I don't know what that is. I think that's Shanghai. These are what is known as megacities. And the current definition of a megacity is something which is a population of more than 50 million people. And we have never had to deal with 50 million people before in one place. We just don't know how to do it. And so the interesting question is, is there a science that underlies megacities? Or is it just going to be patching on you know, systems of traffic control and things like that? And I think you can make an argument, or I will make an argument, that at a high level, a city is basically the same thing as the BASF plant at Ludwigshafen. That is, it's an exercise in mass transport, food, water, goods into the city, mass transport of waste and things like that out of the city, control of epidemics, distribution of goods and services, all the rest of this kind of thing. And with 50 million people, you're getting to be a big enough ensemble that you should be able to put together something that looks like a statistical mechanics of very large populations. Really interesting subject. People are beginning to think in these terms. So it's both an enormously interesting practical problem, but also a very interesting theoretical problem. The two are inexplicably entwined. And the question then is, should you go at it from the point of view of practicality or intellect. Now, in 2007, I went to a meeting in Avignon, which was a meeting on ethics of science, and it was really weird. There were, you know, 200 ethicists and about two or three scientists, and we were supposed to be thinking about the ethics of nanotechnology, and it took about 20 minutes to decide there were no ethical problems in nanotechnology, so we didn't have to worry about that. But then, given the fact there were several days and really excellent food, nobody wanted to go home. <laughs> so we sat around and talked about what ethical problems were. And <clears throat> the conclusion was really quite striking. And you know, the questions that you ask in ethics are, what are the biggest ethical problems that are around? And who's responsible for them? And who is obligated to whom for what? Are there obligations? And it very much comes into what you all do because the money that pays your salary is not generated with rain clouds and falls into Patrick's hands. It actually comes from people. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But there's a real issue there. And so here are some big problems. I'll just go through a couple of them. I think everybody would probably come up with the same approximate list, but uh, with different names and labels. But let's just take a couple. Um, maintaining the globe global stewardship. You can argue this is one of our biggest responsibilities in the next hundred years. And that's you know, phrased scientifically in terms of things like climate variability. Or healthcare, which is not just a question of profit and loss in the healthcare system, but it's a question of how you distribute the benefits of a healthcare system across the full spectrum of the society. How do you do that? And what are the metrics that you use? And how do you, how do you pay for it? And who pays for it? And what's the price structure? All those kinds of issues. And one that I happen to be particularly interested in, which is jobs. It's not so much that you say, do jobs count? Well, in an individual sense, they're a nuisance. But jobs, particularly entry-level jobs, are the way you all, young people, take the first steps from being students to being adults in a society. And if those jobs go away, then it's very hard to do that. So it's something which jobs are much more important in our world than just the question of are you making $20 an hour or $18 an hour. It, it's a whole question of self-respect and place in the society. So how do, we, how do we put all these kinds of things together? 
And I think I come back to robots in the end, but I'll talk about it. Then in terms of understanding, these are, are practical problems. There's issues like life and how does the mind think and where does it come from, dissipative systems. This was what I was going to talk about, but that's another talk. And then issues like complexity and emergence, which have a lot to do with how does life appear in a collection of molecules and reactions. Now, viewing this from the point of view of chemistry, and I'm doing this for a reason, chemistry has had a terrific run. And I want to talk about it from the point of view of chemistry because it's relevant to the microfluidics story here, and also for another reason, and that is that if you think about the three sciences, which are mathematics does something different, but physics, chemistry, biology, um, for a period of time, chemistry has been sort of the bottom end of that hierarchy. And what surprised these, this ethical crowd was to find that that order is inverted. Because for a period of about, um, well, you can make an argument that for 100 years, what's really changed the world has been dominated by physics and its outcomes. So quantum mechanics made possible everything from Facebook to nuclear weapons. Really, really big changes in society. There was an argument that genomics was going to rewrite science in another way. It hasn't worked out that way, or at least it hasn't worked out that way yet. It may work out that way in the future. But if you think about problems like megacities, what is life, what is sentience, all these, the rest of these kinds of things, maintaining the globe, <coughs> the cost of health care, those problems are all basically problems in chemistry. The problem is, and the reason for bringing it up with you all, is that <clears throat> you can phrase what you do in terms of we make paint, or you can phrase it in terms of we change the world, and it actually makes a very different, big difference in the way the field operates. And I think you should think about it in terms of we're, the, we're at the driving wheel right now. We are this discipline of dealing with you know, this kind of reality is probably the most important part of science at this stage, science and technology. So anyway, chemistry has done this collection of stuff. I mean, tremendous progress in synthesizing complex molecules and structure and catalysis, environmental maintenance, ultimate sensitivity and single molecule sense and drugs and things like that. So the question is, is there a problem? And you know, what's wrong if everything's going so well? Why do we worry about it? And to understand the answer to that, you have to think about a couple of other issues that are, again, policy issues that are outside the normal discussions of science. One of them is that a big change in the last 50 years in particular has been the universal acceptance of capitalism as our dominant financial ideology. You may or may not like it, but it's sort of the way it works right now. And so, to my great annoyance, and I should say I'm a confirmed hardcore capitalist, I like capitalism in its proper mode, but it really irritates me that we've handed over many of the decisions in this kind of world to Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, for those of you who don't know, is a, your prototypical investment banker. And you talk to the employees in Goldman Sachs and they will say to you very candidly, the only thing that counts is the money. That is, there is no interest in social return, only financial return. And it's going to be one of the things that you all have to do in thinking about your, your science. So this style of capitalism, which is different incidentally than Chinese capitalism and a little different than European capitalism, it only recognizes financial return. It actually assigns a negative value to long-term research. If you're doing a long-term research program, this detracts from the value of your company. And I'll explain why in a moment. The wealth has all changed. It used to be concentrated in the United States to a lesser extent in Europe, and it's now in the way of going to China. The Cold War, which was an enormous source of technological invention, for better or for worse, has been replaced by what we call the Long War. And what that means is the supposition for those who do this kind of thing is that we will be in a series of conflicts like Africa, like Afghanistan, like Syria, like Iraq, 
for a hundred years. Uh, it'll take that long for this period to wrap down. And it's relevant because the technical needs of that kind of conflict are totally different from those in the Cold War. You don't need high technology, you do low technology for that. In globalization, we're in a world in which the cost of the provider is the person who does it, and there's this competition between the US and, and um, China and India for that, with Europe somewhere in between. Information has changed everything, and what we're talking about here is the universities, where this issue of curiosity versus utility is now being argued out. And it's a, it's a very interesting set of changes. So, research universities. Let me give you a brief history. The idea of doing research was basically, you know, it's been around for a long while. The idea of doing research in universities is often attributed to people like Liebig or his colleagues in, in the United Kingdom at that time. And the idea was that exploring how the world works was a form of scholarship. You didn't do just history. You could also try to understand you know, how gases reacted and things of this kind. But the research university, as you know it here, was actually invented in the United States after World War II. It didn't exist before that. And the argument for its invention was that uh, this is the argument. The argument was that we won World War II, whoever we is, based on a combination of the grit of the fighting man plus technology, radar and high octane gasoline and things like that. If you're Russian, you have a very different view of how the world was, the war was won. I mean, it, so I'm not going to argue its correctness, but that was the argument. And within this argument, it was then a further argument that the United States needed a method of replicating in the universities the technical competence in the big industrial research laboratories. So IBM, General Motors, General Electric, places like that. Not at all what you think of when you think of Dijen. That's a completely different notion. So in this view, the research universities were designed to provide technical capability for national security. And a very important um, document written by the uh, science advisor at the time, Vannevar Bush, said in The Endless Frontier, said that we needed research universities to deal with three practical problems. One was jobs, the second was health, and the third was national security. That was what they were for. There was never an argument that they were supposed to support curiosity-driven research. Just didn't come into it. So now this has devolved into this pair of questions, which is the sort of current policy question. There's a lot of people in the university who say the best way to solve national problems is to just follow curiosity. You have smart people in the universities. They follow curiosity. They play, if need be. And out of that play comes unexpected discoveries, which then become a critical element in solving problems. That's one argument. The other argument is, look, we got really practical problems to solve. We have to figure out what to do with CO2, for example. And you've got to go, if you're in the university, you've got to go solve that problem. Now, if you want to take 20% of the money and do basic research in that area because you don't know how to do it, that's fine. But we expect progress reports on how you're doing with our CO2 problem. And there are quite different views of how you run things. You can probably run good long-term research in both ways. But it's not the same thing. There's another very important change <coughs> that's occurred, which comes down to a model that is clearest again in chemistry. Uh, it has different forms in both physics and biology, but in chemistry. There are three players in this, this story. There's government, industry, and universities, with research universities. The idea is that government collects money from taxes, from individuals and industry. Government regulates the behavior of industry through laws and regulation. Government gives money to universities. And then in a very simplified form, the universities invent new science, and this science then feeds into industry, which makes new products. That's, that's the simple argument. Actually, it doesn't work that way at all, or it hasn't in the past. And what has happened is that the flow of information this way has been at least as important as the flow of information that way. 
And I'll give you some examples. This is, these are all areas in which there have been Nobel Prizes. So these are perfectly legitimate examples for um, academic research. Romp, reaction olefin metathesis disproportionation. The Nobel Prize went to, I guess, Sharpless and Grubbs and Chauvin for working out this chemistry. The issue, and I, I have no problem with this, was that that reaction was practiced at more than a million pounds a year in 1960. And it was actually invented in Shell and commercialized as the Shell triolefin process. Now, a lot was done in between <clears throat> to take a reaction that only worked on simple olefins in the vapor phase and to convert it to the current very interesting and flexible reaction that, that was awarded the Nobel Prize. But the basic invention was made in industry. And in fact, you can trace the pathway by which people began to wonder about the industrial reaction, did lots of work largely in industry, and then eventually moved it out into a university. But the flow of information, the flow of stimulation was this way, not this way. And asymmetric epoxidation, those reactions were invented, one in Halcon, one in Monsanto, put together in a very clever way by Barry Sharpless. And this says nothing about the, the correctness of the award. It just says that the basic ideas came from somewhere else. They actually came from industry. Super acids, George Ola. George had worked in a petroleum company, and he was fascinated by these big towers that are filled with hot silica alumina that are used for cracking and they behaved like incredibly strong acids. And they were, because they were basically you were seeing anhydrous silicates as proton donors. But he asked the question of could he replicate that kind of behavior in solution? And that was where the, the super acids came from. And then it is true that NMR spectroscopy was invented in a university in physics, but it would never have had any impact had it not been for Varian and Brooker developing these incredibly sophisticated devices that make it possible for a synthetic chemist who actually doesn't know what a Fourier transform is to push a button and have the most amazing spin manipulations and time reversals that you can think of take place without anybody paying any attention. So why is this relevant? And the answer is that industry is no longer doing any of this. The industry is basically out of the business of doing long-term research. So this is beginning to dry up and we're going to have to do this part of it more on our own. But it's a really interesting problem. Now, for those of you who are students, if you take away a single slide from this talk, this is it. This is the slide of time and risk discounted cash flow. And it is what runs the world in which you live, although you may not see it very clearly. And let me walk you through it qualitatively so you understand why all the things I've said are what they are, more or less. This is a timeline. Here's cash in and cash out. And in the capitalist world, what you do is you think about things just in terms of cash flows. So if you're going to do research, what you assume is that you borrow the money and you pay interest on it. If you're getting a profit, you assume you put it in a bank and you get interest on it. So interest and time become important from that point of view. And so the idea is you start your research program over here and you're borrowing money to pay for the research and that debt is accumulating and you're paying compound interest on it so the total cash flow is negative. And then somewhere in here um, your research maximizes and you begin to start selling a product. Most of this incidentally is development but that's neither here nor there. You begin to um, make a product and money comes in and if everything works well after a while the amount of money that you're coming in and the interest that you're making on that exceeds the total amount that you have here and the system becomes profitable. What you note about this pretty obviously is two things are important. One is interest rates are important. And that is what's known as the cost of capital. How much money are you paying for the stuff you buy? Because that accounts for the early expenses. The second is that the length of time between here and here is important. And that's important because you're paying interest for a longer period of time. The third thing that's important is the risk. You, what I've done is I say you start getting product here, but in fact you don't know you're going to have a product that's successful. And so if the product fails, then you don't make any money and you've just spent stuff. 
And so all the pressures on large industry, which spends lots of money doing this, are to make things incremental, short-term, and inexpensive. That's the notion. And you sort of are stuck with that. So you say, how do you do long-term stuff? And the only player that can do it is universities. So that's, that's the way to think about the problem. Now to back up what I just said, I want to show you one set of data, which I find very interesting. And I think you were originally at some point interested in MEMS. And so these, are, these happen to be data from MEMS. And do you care about MEMS? The mirror array in that projector is a micro mirror array, which is a MEMS device. And my cell phone, actually not my cell phone, which is very primitive, but all of your cell phones, which are very sophisticated, have somewhere between three and six three-axis gyros in them, which are all MEMS devices, and you know, there's all this kind of stuff. So what someone has done <coughs> is to look at the time of discovery of each of these MEMS uh, technologies, and then the time where you could judge somehow full commercial production and ask how much time was involved. The shortest time on here is, well, the mean time is 28 years. So it takes, on average, 28 years to go from the invention of something to full commercialization. The shortest time was here, RF, ID, or RF frequency filters was 13, but they were a pretty late invention. And the longest is, maybe it's this one, 46 years. So if you're doing something really new, those of you who are students, do it soon, and with luck, you might be able to see it commercialized by the time you retire. It really takes forever. And this is, is really pretty important if you're paying for it. There's one other thing that's worthwhile mentioning, <clears throat> and that is that in universities, we tend to think about science and engineering. There's actually a third leg to the stool, which is neither one of those. It's a completely different human activity, and it's called invention. An invention. This is what we've been talking about. Invention is where you go from something that doesn't exist by some whim or playing or curiosity or whatever it is to something that does exist. You do the first experiments to show that there's something there. And I think you can make the case that universities have been very poor at doing this for a while. Now there's one other thing which I'll bring up in chemistry. And it, it applies in other fields as well, but particularly in chemistry. And it, it has something to do with what you'll be doing here. This is a quote from a guy named Bill Bryson, who's a popular historian of science, a very good writer, for those of you who like this kind of thing. And he quotes here, and I'll read it for those of you in the back. Physicists are notoriously scornful of scientists from other fields. True. Right. When the wife of the great Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli left him for a chemist, he was staggered with disbelief. Had she taken a bullfighter, I would have understood, he remarked in wonder to a friend, but a chemist? And <clears throat> this is actually a pretty important point, and I want to return to it in a bit. So what happens in the future? Rewriting the social contract, maybe. And <clears throat> a way of thinking through these problems is to follow the money. And if you follow the money, the process is here. I mean, all of you do get salaries. I hope all of you get salaries. And you get your research stuff paid for. Have you ever thought where the money comes from and whether you have an obligation to the people who paid it? And the people who pay it are taxpayers, either corporations or individuals. They give it to the government. Why do they give it to the government? It's because they go to jail if they don't. But they allow this to happen on the theory that the government will do things which they won't do individually, which will make the world a better place. The government takes an insignificantly small fraction of it and gives it to universities. Universities are supposed to produce two products. One is knowledge and the second is, has been knowledge and the second is, is trained, educated, smart young people. Increasingly now prototype technology. This combination of things goes into the corporations which have the money and the technical muscle to make a solution to a problem real on a large scale. And then that product is what benefits the taxpayers. That's the basic process. So the question is, do you serve this best by having the universities actually try to solve problems, or do you solve it best by having them just follow curiosity and play? That's, that's the argument. So at the moment, 
there are unlimited practical problems to solve. There's no question about that. There are also great opportunities for curiosity-driven research. There's no question about that. But the point I think that's an important one to make is that neither of these opportunity sets nor these things that are curiosity are necessarily the traditional core of the science. And this very strongly comes into what you're doing. The microfluidics is set up to do something which is traditional. Is that the right thing to do? So the way this is being argued out in the US is in terms of this diagram. It's oversimplified, but it's actually a pretty useful diagram. And what it says is the following. We're going to make a two by two plot. This comes from McKinsey or other consultants, Bain. And it's two by two because three by three is just too complicated to understand. So make a two by two plot with fundamentals here and utility here. And you say that if it's mostly fundamental to give it a kind of personality, this is ascribed to Bohr, who arguably understood his particular approach to atoms just because he wanted to know how they work. And Mr. Edison, in this high utility, basically wanted to get light out of light bulbs and he didn't care how it was done. <clears throat> but then the two that are interesting are here and here. This one is what's called the Pasteur quadrant. And if you think about Mr. Pasteur, who was one of your countrymen, he did a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. And in particular, he arguably is often called the father of microbiology in its modern form. He was the first person, one of the first people to work in vaccination, and so an inventor of applied immunology. And then techniques like pasteurization, heating milk to avoid spoilage, uh, has been enormously useful in all kinds of ways. <coughs> but what's interesting about his work is that he was trying to solve very practical problems down here. I mean, he was trying to solve problems of food spoilage and sickness. But to do that, he had to invent entire new fields of science. And that's the interesting argument for you all to think about. Is that what you want to do? Or do you want to do this and assume that you'll come up with interesting stuff, put it on a shelf, and then someone down here will come find it and use it? And I would argue that this is a much better way of spending your time because you get to do both. It's also much harder. I would make one point about this segment, which is left blank. And that is called, in Washington, the university quadrant. <laughs> that is, it's research which is often taken to be neither useful nor interesting. And I think that's often correct. Because a lot of the research that's done in universities is done primarily to satisfy the peer review system, not to come up with something new. Don't ask me how you solve that problem, but it's a, it's a real and interesting problem. All right, so there are two ways of thinking about this, and this is one to work out. People who don't like this idea say that what Pasteur's quadrant is is just taking known science and making incremental improvements. Those who like it say it's taking areas where there are big problems, megacities or what is life or thinking about infectious disease or whatever it might be, and then inventing the science to solve it. And they're two completely different views of the same thing. Now, there's always something that comes up at this point, which is quantum mechanics. And people will say, quantum mechanics is the biggest deal. It was done purely for curiosity. It's changed everything. I mean, the species has changed. You all in the front row are hive animals. I was basically put together as an individual. And so my notions of privacy and individuality are gone. You live as a collective. And you know, I mean, this is all amazing. And it all happened because of quantum mechanics. And you would never, never, never have guessed any of that was true, ever. I would make two remarks about quantum mechanics. First, I agree with all of that. The second is, there's been one example. There's one quantum mechanics. And if you try to think of something else that's happened in the last 100 years that has the impact of quantum mechanics, I think you won't be able to come up with it. So you can't make general policy cases based on special circumstances. The second thing is that if you want to take quantum mechanics as the basis for an argument that says science, fundamental science is basically an art form and it should be appreciated by society as art, not necessarily for simple utility, then terrific, I'm for it. Yeah. Good idea. And 
I like music and I like ballet. And the only point that I would make is that if you want to put science on the same footing as ballet, you have to understand what society is willing to pay for ballet. And what society pays for ballet is less than what society pays for the cost of acetone in this group per week. So you sort of can't have it both ways. You can't be a special case consuming an enormous amount of money and expect to be treated as a kind of social good. Um, in another way, it just won't work that way. So I want to just make a case, and that is that when we have this argument about science forward and problem backwards, you actually can't tell the difference. It's a non-argument to me. And I'll give you a couple of examples, and I'll show you a couple of things at the end which are our approach to this. Here's one. This is a practical problem, which is healthcare for the developing world. Healthcare for the developing world is exactly the same thing as, turns out to be in large case, exactly the same thing as point of care medicine, and is the step toward bringing technology into public health and bringing technology into public health as a way of reducing health care costs. Now, the technology required to make this work is really interesting technically. I mean, it's really interesting technically. But it's completely different than what we do at end-of-life medicine with anti-cancer antibodies. It's just a, a different vein of reasoning. So this is a problem. It's a practical problem. That's a practical problem. Uh, healthcare reduction, cost reduction is a practical problem. But there are very interesting technical problems to be solved along the way. Conceptual also, but that's a different issue. This problem we've mentioned. Um, everywhere you look in this, there are enormous, enormously important for society technical problems. But pick any one of these things. How do we get the... the the efficiency of a methane-fueled internal combustion engine up by 1%. Do that, and you've probably done more for energy uh, utilization globally than anything that will ever come out of, out of new forms of solar photovoltaics. And we don't work on these kinds of problems, but they're very interesting problems. Megacities, I've talked about this. It's hard to think of a more abstract and interesting problem than putting together sociology and population dynamics and microfluidics to develop a fluidic slash statistical mechanics for populations of people moving around. But it's also maybe practically enormously useful. Here, I've mentioned this. If you look at this, which is just a small section of the, the uh, metabolic activity going on in the cell, and saying, and say, how do we go from here to here? As I said, we have no idea. There's no theory, no model for that, not a clue. And in fact, arguably, in some ways, impossible. Um, many of these will be described, these reactions will be described by nonlinear differential equations. <clears throat> and you can't analytically solve a set of three nonlinear di differential equations. Nonlinear differential equations, you can't do it. Um, at least at present. So here you have a million nonlinear differential equations. Um, that will not be a soluble problem. So we're going to have to invent something fundamentally new there. And that's a neat problem, but also, by the way, if you can do that, we can start putting together a basis for systems biology and disease. And then <clears throat> this problem is one that is local and maybe a little bit easier to understand. There is a model in drug development. Let me take a step back. The pharmaceutical industry is going out of business right now. Um, and I say that because the cost of capital is higher than the return on invested capital for the global industry. And <clears throat> part of the reason is that they deal with a really hard problem, which is how do you design ligands that, that effectively deliver health. A very small subset of this is how do you define ligands that just stick in the active site of a protein. This question of going from a crystal structure to a ligand design lock and key metaphor has been one which has been clearly stated since I went to graduate school. It's been around for 50 years. But if you think about the way that's phrased, you know there has to be something wrong. Because what I said is I've got a protein and then I have a ligand and complementarity in shape is going to make for a good fit. But what I've done is to leave out all the solvents. 
And it's more and more looking as if ligand sticking to protein has nothing to do with complementarity in shape between protein and ligand, but actually has to do with the fact that the water in certain cavities is high in free energy, and a roughly right-shaped thing when it goes in releases that water, and that's what's energetically favorable. Completely different view of things. That's a fundamental problem, but by the way, it's also practically very useful. So what's next? Well, we have the possibility here of a revolution. And what makes for revolutions in science? This is a pretty entertaining subject, and one that everyone should look at. There are two major arguments. There are a whole bunch of arguments, but there are two major ones. One says that you get a revolution in science when you have new tools. And we know that, to an extent, that's true. Organic synthesis was made possible by NMR and IR and mass spectroscopy. Because without those tools, you had no idea what you were making. So it's critically important. PCR and some sequencing techniques basically made molecular biology possible. And STM was the thing that opened the door to nanotechnology. So, I mean, fine. So that, we pretty well understand that. The more interesting argument is this one put together by Thomas Kuhn and then pushed by Mr. Popper and Mr. Feuerabend in various ways. And what he said was that scientists are as lazy as anyone else is. And so you only go to the effort of putting together a revolution if you have no choice. And his argument is that you have revolutions in science when you have an incompatibility between observation and the theory that the science believes in. So for example, hydrophobic effect is due to a hydrophobic surface sticking to a hydrophobic surface in a protein. The only trouble is we've had that idea for 50 years and it hasn't worked, so you've got to do something else. The issue with quantum mechanics, which is the classic example, was that in 1900, physics was dead. Everyone understood there was nothing left for physics to do. And after all, if you think about it, you had a ball, you dropped it, it went down, it followed Newton's laws, I mean, what more do you want? And then you had Maxwell's equations, which pretty much described everything in electromagnetism. And by the way, a lot of other stuff that was not known at the time. So what else did you need? The only problem was you took a slit, let sunlight shine through it, ran it through a prism, onto a wall, and you got the solar spectrum. And everything was terrific, except there were these funny little black lines. And the funny little black lines couldn't be explained. And they were, of course, the state-to-state -state transitions that make up the Balmer spectrum. And there was no way of explaining them. So off went the group of people who did this and completely turned everything on their end. It turns out that everything that was in physics at that point worked up to a point, but only so far. Now, if you read Kuhn's book, and I argue for those of you who are students, it's a nice short book. And go dig it off the web and read it. It really is an important thing to get a sense of in your education. But this basic issue, he's very forgiving about puzzle solving because it generates the data that shows where there's a, a real problem. But I think it's more fun to try to be, to, to the extent you can, a problem solver rather than a puzzle solver. I mean, I think it's, it's a better ambition to have. So that's one of the things that's being worked out here. So now, now the issue is problems. And I'm talking about all this stuff. I just want to give you a couple of examples very quickly of how we connect these things. And I'm going to show you one failure and two in-progress successes. So this is the first one, carbon dioxide. Um, the basic problem is ranking a lot of carbon dioxide. We have absolutely no idea what to do with it. The only solution around is pushing in holes in the ground, and we don't actually have any evidence that that will work. It may or may not, but the, th the theory has not been worked out. But there's, you know, to generate options, we have to know more about it. And this is a good chemical problem. Um, our current model for the pharmaceutical industry, which consumes somewhere between 5 per and 10 percent of the world's petroleum production, is that you start with inexpensive, reduced hydrocarbons, <coughs> You crack them to things like this, and then you use a very cheap oxidant like O2 to make intermediate oxidation state organics. This is how we do it. Another way of doing it would, in principle, be to note the fact that in the immediate future, CO2 may be so available that it has a negative cost. 
meaning people will pay you to take it away. That would be the first time in the history of everything. If this is inexpensive enough, then in principle you can use a more expensive reducing agent and get to the same thing. So we should be able to redo the entire petroleum economy based on CO2, except that we don't know how to do it because nobody has done any research on CO2 for ever, more or less. And you know there are occasional things that have been done, but it's, the, there is no base of information, reaction chemistry to do that. It's a very interesting problem. And it boils down to one problem. How do you take CO2 and make carbon-carbon bonds in expensive ways? We don't know. We've tried a bunch of things and we've failed, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, it has to be doable. I just don't know how to do it. I've talked about this before, and this leads to something which is familiar here, and I just want to give you a progress report on this. What we did was to decide that we were going to approach this problem of diagnostics for the developing world by starting from an economic vantage and saying we would develop technology that had the characteristic that it was designed to be as inexpensive as possible. So we basically set up a technology based on printing in the sense of newspapers or comic books in which you take a drop of blood, you put it on one of these paper chips, a membrane filters out erythrocytes, the serum goes through to the other side, and you get colors. So it's very straightforward to do. What's interesting about it is, sorry, this is the current device, and it's, we started this stuff in 2007. It's now 212, 213, and we've just finished the first large uh, field trials in Vietnam. <coughs> And to be able to go from nothing to field trials in four years is just astonishing. And it was done because the intellectual vector here was simplicity. And that's interesting. I mean, to figure out what these vectors are that enable you to solve problems quickly and cheaply. I don't want to spend time on that. The third topic is jobs. And I told you I'm very, very interested in jobs because it's so important for you guys. If you don't have good jobs, then what's going on? And some of you have seen this before, but I want to show you what the point of interest here is that there's a very highly established industry called the robotics industry. And I'll show you an example in a moment, but what can an outsider, particularly what can a chemist bring? And the answer comes from looking at something like this. This is our model our inspiration, our muse. It's an octopus. And the octopus is doing something that a conventional robot can't do, which is in this case to crawl out of a very small hole, a hole that's much smaller than the, the octopus is. And if you look at the octopus, it's all chemistry and fluidics. I mean, the octopus, the way octopuses do their thing is with a, a anatomical feature known as a, a hydrostat, which is basically a long tube filled with incompressible liquid. And if you squeeze here, it has to bulge over here. These are not used at all in the world that we know. They use muscles, which we don't know how to do. Notice, incidentally, how extremely self-satisfied this creature looks here, having gotten out through that little hole. You can't do this. And so the innovation here comes in looking at something like this and saying, this has nothing to do with hard robots. It has to do with polymers and elastomers, and maybe we can do that. And I want to show you what the competing hard robot is because there's really an important point here. This is something called Big Dog. And Big Dog, among other things, has no brain. It's just a collection of gyros and accelerometers. And the point that I will make to you is that I can't tell that that thing isn't alive. I mean, it is so lifelike. And the point to, to make is that if you take this and extend it 10 to 20 years into the future, you know, assume there will be rapid progress, and then you put on the front end of it an artificial intelligence system, I'm willing to put big money on the fact that we will have things that are machines that are as intelligent as horses, which is not a very intelligent thing, or make a cow, which is even less intelligent, in that period. Now, it's not going to be alive, but it will compete with you for jobs of that sort, if you think you want to be a cow. <laughs>
Um, and it'll go on from there. So it really is going to be a big change. And the, you know, the strategic question here is the question of not do you want robots or not robots. It's not a question of a world without robots or a world with robots. Rather, putting it more locally, it is are you, with the assistance of robots, going to be able to do things that find you a job in the world? That is, what can you do that puts humans and machines, intelligent machines, together to solve problems that can't be solved otherwise? And it's a really interesting question. What we're doing with the things that I'll show you, I think I'm going to show you an example, is putting together assistance for surgeons, where you need small hands. Uh, this is just a, this gives you an idea of something that can be done here. Yes, here we are. This is a gripper. There's the gripper. It's actuated by a single pressure line in here. That's an uncooked egg. So it comes down, you apply pressure here, fingers fold up, picks up the egg. And that turns out to be a, a control problem that's a very major problem when you're working with hard robots. It's very hard to do. But here's the thing which is sort of interesting. Here's the thing that's sort of interesting to make the differentiation. It's the same hand, and that's a mallet. <laughs> it works just fine. You can't do that with hard robots. And you obviously can't do it with this. <coughs> so this is the kind of thing that you can do in principle here. You can't do otherwise. You can drive cars over these. It doesn't make any difference at all. They're not good for some other things. But by going off in a direction which is not what the robotics people do, using chemistry which they don't know anything about, and combining it with anatomy which comes out of invertebrate physiology, you all of a sudden see there are just a host of interesting things to do with squid, with insects, with other kinds of things. Uh, we'll skip that one. So what to do? Situation. Solution to the most important problems around, I think, now depend on chemistry. Um, most interesting problems also belong to chemistry. And I extend this to mean condensed matter physics and material science and whatever. So we knew, need new stuff. But these fields are incredibly timid and risk averse now. I mean, I talk to young people, and the only thing that I get is, how do I get a grant? Isn't it too risky to do something? I mean, I've got to get some money to get my research group going. And I'll come to this in a moment. Industry isn't going to do anything different. It just can't. And teaching is incredibly bad. I mean, it's just awful. And what are... So universities have to change because basically industry can't. It's constrained by capitalism. Government really has no capacity for innovation. What, what government can do is to do the political process, but it can't really change the, the world by doing something new. The university has the smart young people and can work on problems and puzzles and make its own choices. But what we have to do, if you think about it, is broaden the definitions of what you're working on. Those of you who are in the whatever it is, ISP, P, IP, I'll quit it. I'm sorry, I will learn it eventually. <laughs> but anyway, those of you who are. Yeah, PGG, okay, yeah, all right. I mean, I'm a person of normal intelligence in a year or so, I'll get it right. I mean, one of, the, one of the big things, incidentally, this is, this is a piece of advice. One of the great successes, one of the things you learn in working with DARPA, is that when you put together a new idea, the first thing you do is you find a logo that's easy to remember. The second thing you do is to have an acronym that's easy to remember. And then you find a program that fits those two. <laughs> so anyway. Um, these are all things that you know all about in definitions. We can talk about it, but broadening the definition, teaching for breadth, killing old fields, really important. How do you take fields that exist and kill them? We don't have any mechanism. And there's a, a statement in 
uh, an aphorism that says, you can never change anyone's mind, you can only wait for them to die. And we don't really have the time to do that. Make collaborative research and development the norm, not because it's more efficient, but because it's more instructive. And then I'm going to come to this in just a moment. Teaching, how many of you are chemists? Not a bad number. You're taught that this is more acidic than ethanol because of delocalization. It's not. It has nothing to do with it. It's solvation and the fact there's a beta hydroxyl group. You're taught that iodide is more nucleophilic than bromide, is more nucleophilic than chloride and fluoride, even though everyone who teaches you know that it's actually the reverse order. And why do we do that? And the answer is, I think, pretty clearly that we teach those people who teach have taught out of textbooks. And the purpose of a textbook is to sell textbooks, not to teach. And so what you do is to design textbooks to work at the lowest possible level. And that's what you sell. But for bright people who are going to be creative, that's exactly the wrong level. You want to work where the problems are not known, at the top level. This is going to get fixed because the textbook business will go out of business in the next period of time. But it hasn't been fixed yet. Reinvent education. The only thing I would say for those of you who are at the beginning of your careers, do not take the familiar subjects. Go off and take courses in immunology and aeronautics and differential equations and quantum chromodynamics and things that are really hard because you won't be able to do them later. You can learn easy subjects. If you're a chemist, you can learn biology. If you're a biologist, you can't learn physics. It's just very hard to work that way. <clears throat> and then an important issue. The, the, system we use <coughs> is the apprentice system. You know, the basic intellectual model is a professor assigns a problem to a student who does research and who writes a thesis, which becomes a paper. Linear process. Because the whole point of this should be that the professor's business is not to teach the student to be like the professor, but rather to teach the student to be something totally different. And I don't know how you do that in the apprentice model. So we should have a revolt. We all should revolt. Um, I'll skip that at the moment because it's not really relevant here. Now, there's one other thing which is relevant to this, and that is that the question of um, products. I'm going to be done in just a moment. Uh, one of the points in all of this is the question of how you get stuff out into the real world. And the only point that I would make here <coughs> is that there's a very well-defined process for doing this, which centers around the notion of a product. And a product is something that someone will write you a check for because they like it so much. That's all it is. The idea that there's good science, and because there's good science, somebody else should be able to figure out what a product is, does not work. It fails essentially 100% of the time. So if you want to do products, you have to figure out what the product is. And you say, well, that's just scut work. No, it's actually harder by far to come up with a product than it is to write a paper for an academic journal. You can write papers until you're blue in the face I mean, on any subject. Coming up with a product is actually hard. So I recommend it as an exercise. And then two final thoughts, and then I'm done. This is one, and it has to do with this issue of those of you who are beginning, how do you think about risk? And when I talk to people who are starting their careers, over and over again they say, All, everything you said maybe makes sense, maybe it doesn't make sense, but the fact of the matter is we can't do it because we have to get our careers started, and the way we get our careers started is by writing moderately boring proposals that get a little bit of money so that we can get started. But that's the way to do it. And I would make the following argument to you, and this is another Bain two by two exercise. We're going to have, you have a choice between important and unimportant problems, and you can be successful or unsuccessful at them. If you choose an important problem and you solve it, you get a lot of credit. Unimportant problem, you fail, you get no credit. So that the diagonal terms are straightforward. It's the off-diagonal terms that are interesting. If you take an unimportant problem and you solve it, you still don't get any credit. As a matter of fact, it's considered bad since what it says is that you've chosen to pick an unimportant problem. 
Nobody cares whether you solved it because nobody cares about the problem. On the other hand, if you pick an important problem and you solve it, you don't solve it, you still get a lot of credit because you at least opened a door. So from a game theoretic perspective, the winning strategy is to pick important problems whether you solve them or not rather than picking problems that you know that you can be successful at. You say, well, that's all good for you. You're a senior professor. Well, take my word for it. What I just said is correct. And nobody said that you're going into a low-risk game. The final thing has to do with this issue of poetry. Part of the business here is that you're doing research, but you're being paid for by somebody in a society that actually doesn't know a lot about what research is. What's research? What are you doing? It seems to people who make a living that you're sitting in a nice comfortable seat here with your mind reflecting on who knows what while somebody up in the front waves their hand and this doesn't sound at all like actually fixing cars or you know, doing something like that. They just don't know what you're doing. And I've had a number of experiences in which there's a generic problem when you get older and that is you go to cocktail parties. This is risky, bad for your soul. And one of the issues when you do this is you're sitting next to someone and you realize that you're stuck with them and there's no way you can get away from them for the next two hours. And the prospect is just horrible. So how do you do it? And there's a strategy and it works really well. Somebody says, hello, my name is something. What do you do? And you say, well, I'm a chemist. They say, oh, what? that's not so interesting. What do chemists do? And you say, well, we make statins, and statins block HMG-CoA reductase and act as anti-inflammatories. They're a major source of sales to the pharmaceutical industry. And when you look up, they're gone. <laughs> They've left. <laughs> now, that may solve the local problem, but it doesn't solve the global problem of making them interested in what you're doing. So how do you do that with the same thing? And you say... I make statins, and statins change the way we die. And you've got them. They're really interested. It's just the way you phrase it. Think about what people are interested in. They're not interested in what you do. They're interested in the function. And the world is full of people who are intelligent, who are very interested in science, who want to make the world a better place. But you have to go all the way to them in exactly the same way you've got to go all the way to product. So it isn't enough to stay here do the research, write the papers, and say that's it, all the way. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. We've gone on for a while. I'm not offended if we just leave, everybody leaves.